Welcome to the uh, first uh, in our special seminar series on climate change and infectious diseases. Thank you. That was cool. <laughs> That's the first one, so it could be anything. Um, so, uh, to kick this uh, series of uh, seminars off, we invited a uh, special guest, Dr. Bill Risen from uh, University of California at uh, Davis. Uh, I've had a 30 seconds to review this uh, resume, <laughs> uh, but I've known Bill for a long time, and I can probably come up with a lot of Don't, not that. Let's not go back that <laughs> long. <laughs> uh, so, we you seen this uh, last Clemson. Clemson. And PhD from Oklahoma. Um, he then spent uh, a number of years in uh, Pakistan with the University of, Delaware, the University of Maryland working on uh, malaria and the monopoly vectors of malaria in Pakistan. And then he went to the um, University was it, was it Berkeley? Berkeley at the Bakersfield Arbor Steel Station. Grandfathers of Art Oral, Bill, Bill Reed, uh, at Berkeley. And uh, he spent probably, I don't know, 20 years there? Yeah, well, 25. 25. <laughs> uh, uh, there, and, uh, and then about five years ago, six years ago, uh, went to the University of Davis, California System Consolidated. So, uh, Bill, so we invited Bill because he's the only person that I know who has actually has a grant, a federally funded grant to study climate change and vector borne disease. <laughs> and so uh, he's here and he's going to talk to us about the impact of environmental change on mosquito borne other virus transmission. Bill? Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come. I see a, a lot of familiar faces in the room, which is kind of nice. Some of the faces have changed quite a bit, but <laughs> kind of recognize them. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to come here uh, probably, what was it, five or ten years ago and give a seminar, so I hope some of the slides have changed for the people that were the previous one. Um, uh, in giving this talk, uh, Maria asked me to talk about climate change, but in thinking about it, uh, it's really hard to divorce for a complex zoonosis all the parts of the environment and just focus on climate. So I've kind of uh, broadened the topic and I hope the climatologists or geographers here will permit me to talk about other things other than just specifically climate. I also, since this is a climate group, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about what climate is and what drives it and how all the uh, physics of climatology, which I presume everyone knows already. So, <clears throat> so some of you may not be arbovirologists, so I thought I'd present a couple of little background slides. First, arboviruses are a taxonomically diverse group of viruses. The only thing they really have in common is they're transmitted by arthropods, but there are arboviruses that don't have an arthropod vector and there are some that don't have a vertebrate host, but they're, so they're a big catch-all of viruses. Most of these probably originated as tropical zoonoses and then some, such as dengue and yellow fever, have evolved to become anthropoenoses, that is transmitted from human to mosquito to human. This is uh, yellow fever with its uh, jungle cycle spilling over to intrusive agriculture, then moving into villages where they're transmitted from human uh, to mosquito to human. <clears throat> All of the viruses require a host, a vector, and a pathogen, and these have to come together in time and space uh, to form a nidus of transmission. And th this has to be set within a permissive environment. Obviously, if the environment is not conducive to allow this to occur, transmission is impossible. 
Some of the variability of the environment in, that I think are important and I'll talk briefly about human population growth, landscape alteration and how these have generated climate change and then the importance of connectivity about all these then and, and some of the nuances that our transportation by people have done to these systems. So uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned there's zoonoses become uh, if the uh, zoonotic host is a primate, there's a high probability that it can go than human, mosquito, human. If the zoonotic host is a bird, then most likely it exploits commensals as these viruses become more or less urbanized. The evolution seems to be as a complex from complex uh, cycles in the tropics with a lot of diversity to more simple transmission either going from sylvan to urban or tropical to temperate ecosystems. The barriers to transmission that these viruses have to overcome are rather remarkable when you consider that they're just little pieces of RNA. They have to overcome very different host immune systems and also very different temperature regimens Remember that the arthropods are poikilotherms, so they're essentially at environmental temperature, whereas when they get into a febrile crow, it can be upwards of 44 degrees centigrade. So there's quite a diversity of environment that the virus must maintain. The virus also must produce a sufficient viremia in the commensal or human host to infect the arthropod because getting through the innate immune system is usually dose dependent. <coughs> The virus must persist during unfavorable periods and in the tropics this can be droughts or dry periods but in looking outside I got a, a feeling of New England you know coming here from California and the temperate winters uh, certainly are an obstacle to persistence or they have to be repeatedly reintroduced. <coughs> For uh, urbanization the vectors and hosts must exploit the domestic paradomestic environment including development in uh, containers or wastewater living in and around homes and exploiting what lives there for blood meal sources so these are all obstacles that the viruses have to uh, overcome I've been spending the last decade or so of my life studying West Nile virus so uh, unexplainably most of the ex uh, examples will come from this virus. This is a flavivirus in the Japanese encephalitis zero group. It's related to St. Louis encephalitis which used to be the, one of the um, higher causes of infectious encephalitis in the U.S. during the 70s especially in the Ohio River Basin. Um, it's no longer very prevalent. Uh, the virus was discovered in the West Nile district of Uganda in 37 during a fever uh, survey. <clears throat> the disease ranges from inapparent infection to flu-like to neuroinvasive disease to, to death, rarely death. Uh, recently, however, they've discovered that individuals that are both asymptomatic and febrile can develop possible chronic kidney infarction and this considering there may have been over two million Americans infected with West Nile, this has a strong possibility as a sort of un, uh, unappreciated complication. There's epidemics uh, have occurred initially in Upper Egypt and South Africa in the 50s. In the Mediterranean there were intrusions in, uh, in the 90s and then it jumped over the pond in 1997 leading to the largest epidemic in the, in the 2000s. The, uh, when you think about the virus coming from the tropics coming to New York City and then spreading coast to coast within four years and then from Canada to Argentina it's just really remarkable that this virus has got around so quickly and been quite so successful. Uh, estimating uh, the CDC estimates there's been over 30 there's been over 30,000 confirmed cases and this translates into about based on this sort of a pyramid into over 2 million uh, Americans infected as I mentioned the virus came out of Uganda it spread in the 50s to India down into South Africa into Upper Egypt and then in the 90s over here uh, 
There was some thought that JE might provide a barrier coming into Asia, but recently uh, they suggested that it may also be in Asia. So one of the things with the environment to think about, at least uh, it struck me when I was putting this together, that uh, in my lifetime the Earth's population has trebled, going from 2.5 to 7.5 billion people. And that's a whole lot for one generation to absorb, I think. And with it, of course, is the, uh, the need for resources and, and, the, and the effect of acquiring these resources has had on the planet. The, um, the, there is geographical differences in the growth rates, and the countries here in light green are the ones that have the highest growth rates. But <clears throat> not necessarily the highest densities. When you look at densities, population densities are highest in uh, India, Asia, and Europe. And these areas have low densities but high growth rates. Another thing that's happened uh, just recently is for, uh, last year for the first time, uh, the demographers estimate that more than half of the world's population lives in cities. So no longer are we worried about agricultural problems. We're now having to focus more and more on urban problems. And this is uh, perhaps what we're thinking of now for disease transmission is certainly a little easier. <clears throat> and this doesn't matter where you're living, whether in the world, uh, Africa, Asia, all over, that more than half of the population now lives in cities. So what effect does arthropod-borne diseases have on all this? Well, it's kind of hard to put it in, uh, to get a case study, but <clears throat> in 1945, the death rate in Sri Lanka was 22 per thousand, and that was with uh, very, very high malaria transmission. In 46, they brought in a DDT program, eliminating the, uh, or almost eliminating the vectors, and malaria dropped sharply. Uh, after nine years, the death rate was 10 per thousand, and by 2006, only 6 per thousand. But a decline has not been shown in the birth rate. So when all this comes down to is that the annual growth rate is still about 1.3 percent per year, and at this rate, the population is scheduled to double in 53 years. So with just eliminating a disease like malaria, can have a remarkable effect long term on demography. <clears throat> and if you look back at those countries that we showed earlier that have the highest population per capita growth rates, these are also the countries that we're targeting with rollback malaria and other health programs and we'll be facing the same situation with the uh, eliminating the burden of disease I think in the future. Well as I mentioned more humans require more resources this is the percent of uh, forest cover loss estimated by these people in this five-year period. It was, I was surprised to see the U.S. as the leader. <coughs> this is uh, where I was living for a long time right here in Bakersfield. This is the southern San Joaquin Valley of California so in a hundred years it went from a, uh, a sort of intermittent wetland, salt marsh, grass environment to right now it's irrigated agriculture, towns and cities with uh, Bakersfield has gone up an order of magnitude in number and same with Fresno. There's now, believe it or not, 800,000 people living in Bakersfield and about 1.3 million in, in Fresno. This corridor is also, with this change, <coughs> is an, an increased human density it, and is some of the warmest areas in California. And this is also where we see our corridor of West Nile transmission right up the Central Valley. Uh, all this change in the environment and urbanization results in uh, urbanized heat islands that's been well described. This, I didn't have a picture for Bakersfield, this is New York City, and this is the vegetation pattern and this is the heat pattern uh, with the uh, hotter areas being in light color. So th there are pockets of cooler areas that correspond to vegetation. So eliminating the vegetation increases the temperature. Another factor that urbanization 
occurs is that it uh, decreases avian richness. So with increased land heterogeneity, you get an increase in, uh, in avian richness, but with development, housing maturity, and distance to natural areas, you get decreases. This uh, is also relates to transmission of West Nile, where you wind up having a decrease in West Nile transmission as a function of the number of non-passerine species present. This is because the <clears throat> it's only the passerines are the best hosts for the virus. This is the log, this is the log viremia, serum viremia, and these are days post-infection by different orders of birds. You can see up here where, where for the passerines we're looking at at 10 to the 10 or higher, whereas if you look at chickens, we're down here at 10 to the 2. And this is important because uh, the uh, viremia is directly related to how infectious these birds are for mosquitoes. And we'll show that later. Well, in summary then, uh, for the human environmental change, uh, population growth is declining, but the number of people seem to be increasing. The trends in, hi in human distribution are from rural to urban. There's high connectivity. <coughs> Urbanization tends to uh, increase host densities of humans and commensals, decreases diversity, increased uh, habitat and density for commensal species, and increase then the possibilities of human mosquito contact and then alters climate change. Well climate uh, affects all components of the transmission cycle, the vector, the virus, as well as the host, and uh, their demography is what drives the efficiency of, and behavior is what drives the efficiency of transmission. Um, climate is, sort of determines the rates, especially temperature. There are scales of climate variability to think of in that the short-term variability is what we normally think of as weather. Intermediately, we think of cycles like El Nino or the Southern Oscillation, and long-term, we think of as this trend for global warming. Uh, <clears throat> in parallel with the increase in the human population curve I showed before, there's pretty much an increase in carbon dioxide. This slope is pretty parallel to the other as well as an increase in global temperatures. The, uh, some pretty smart guys doing a bunch of models have projected this out to the next millennium and are, uh, all of the models show an increase in temperature and the range is pretty wide though, trying to predict what's going on almost 100 years in the future. And of course then there's some other data that m may be more substantial. <coughs> So climate change we is, a, is an increase in greenhouse gases, warming temperature. Uh, this tends to be not equally distributed and tends to be greatest in northern latitudes. There's also cycles in this long-term trends. Precipitation I'm not going to talk about too much, but there is increased in floods and droughts. There seems to be a variable effect in the U.S with some areas getting weather, wetter and others drier, we're having a prolonged drought in the southwest, which people are trying to tie into climate change. Uh, water affects mosquito habitats, but it's a two-edged sword. Too much water washes them out. Too little water, they don't have any breeding habitat. Um, for urban mosquitoes, uh, uh, a little bit of drought is pretty good because everybody, at least in California, turns on the lawn sprinklers and we get curb drizzle into the catch basins that are just great for mosquitoes. Just enough for them without drying them out. And they're refreshed every day because everybody's got their sprinklers on a timer. <coughs> uh, we're also looking at sea surface rise and storm extremes, but I'm not going to have time to go into these. So uh, what is the impact of increasing temperature on arbovirus transmission? Well, it, alter, that it alters most of the factors related to transmission. This can be shown by the vectorial capacity equation, speeds up mosquito population growth, shortens the overwintering period, lengthens the transmission season, obviously these are the same, alters pathogen and vector distributions in latitude and elevation.
So this is the uh, transmission uh, equation or vectorial capacity equation from Garrett Jones. This is not very new. This actually are the factors, the entomological components of the old Ross McDonald malaria model. The ones that I've shown in red are influenced by temperature and include mosquito host biting rate and the duration of the gonotrophic cycle. A P is the probability of survival, that is how long the mosquitoes will live. And N is the dur duration of the extrinsic incubation period or how long it takes from them being infected until they tr can transmit. So for mosquitoes are holometabolous insects and they lay eggs, go through a larval and pupal stage and then emerge as adults. This, this duration of uh, each generation is directly related to temperature and if you take the inverse of the duration and plot it as a rate function of temperature you can develop a uh, degree day model which uh, for Culex tarsalis has a threshold of about six degrees centigrade below which the larvae will not develop and it takes a total of about 270 degree days. <clears throat> After they emerge they harden, take sugar, mate and then will host seek and the timing between when it takes a blood meal until it digests it and lays eggs and comes back and refeeds is called the gonotrophic cycle. If you take this duration, the same thing, calculate a rate, you can fit a linear uh, degree day model again. Here the thresholds at five and the degree days are 33. Measuring the extrinsic incubation period as a function of temperature is a little more difficult. What we, what we had done is rear the mosquitoes in the insectary, feed them on a blood virus mixture, hold them at different times at different temperatures, <clears throat> anesthetize them and take them apart, and uh, plug their proboscis into a tube. But they're still alive at this point, believe it or not, and they will involuntarily expectorate and you can then collect virus in the tube and see if they could transmit or not. So by testing the bodies you can tell if they're infected and testing the expectorate you can see if they transmit and we usually do this on a vero cell plaque assay, these little holes are the plaques, each one a virus. So as I meant, oh sorry I thought you had a question. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned the proportion infected is a direct function of the titer of the host and these uh, in our experiments the, we didn't feed them on pledges we fed them on birds and uh, got a variable response so then we then held them at different temperatures 14, 18, 22 and on each points are days that we took out 25 of them and saw if they were how much virus was in them. This is the amount of virus in the body over time and as, as the temperature became hotter not only did, they, did the virus grow quicker but it also grew to slightly higher titers. If we took the time till 50 percent of them were, of the infected individuals could transmit we would then have points along this line which we could turn this, this duration into a rate and plot it again as a degree day model so we were able to develop a degree day model of about 108 de uh, degree days with a minimum threshold of 14 degrees for transmission. This is the actual duration and time as a function of temperature they were in incubated at. So how does temperature then affect transmission? Well the gonotrophic cycles become shorter as a function of temperature but the time, the duration of the extrinsic incubation period uh, decreases at a much faster rate. At about where this uh, lines, uh, where the extrinsic incubation period becomes less than two gonotrophic cycles is where transmission is most efficient. So to develop a metric that's temperature driven, we have came up with a very simplistic as bytes per transmission or the ratio of the gonotrophic cycle duration over the extrinsic incubation period. So put this in, uh, yes sir. Bill, um, the good news is mosquitoes don't live as long at higher temperatures. 
Well, well I, I. How about the mortality going down? Well, I, I didn't. I took that slide out this morning. Okay, but so they do. And if you plot the decrease in survivorship over time, you get an exponential decrease. But the the, the extrinsic incubation period shortening makes up overcompensates for this. So transmission occurs so much earlier in life. There are theoretically more individuals alive to transmit when it's hotter. But you're right, the, the, it does cut back on the longevity, especially if you work like we did down in Imperial Valley where it's 120 degrees in the summer. They don't live too long. But the virus can go through in almost four or five days down there. Anyway, this is data from Kern County. This is the actual average daily temperature during each month. And this is the duration of the extrinsic incubation period from the degree day model. This is the duration of the, of, the, of the first and second gonotrophic cycles. So when this, when this decreased where they could transmit in less than two cycles, this is when the infection rates, which by the blue bars in the mosquitoes, really took off. So this, this relationship here, we feel, or, or the number of bites per transmission is really very key to when you have most efficient virus transmission. We also have been working with David Hartley from um, Georgetown, and uh, he and Chris Barker put together a, a mechanistic model. I'm, tell, I'm blaming these guys so you won't ask me any mathematical questions. <coughs> so uh, these, uh, this, this is three levels of host competence, a very good host, a moderate host, and a poor host, as well as it's driven by temperature. The most important thing is the actual estimates of R0 over time. During the years when uh, West Nile came to California, this is 2003 through 2009, this is driven by actual temperature surfaces for California. The red lines are R0 and the black lines are the, uh, this uh, T value. So as T drops again down to around 2 bytes per transmission, R0 goes way up in the very hot areas of California, like the Coachella Valley. In the cooler Central Valley, well, relatively, by your standards, it's still hot, but it's a lot cooler than Coachella Valley. And uh, here, as you notice, these, these bars are the sentinel chicken zero conversions when these occurred. And notice there was a lot every year in Coachella sparser in Sacramento and almost none along the coast and that shows we never really got very efficient uh, bites per transmission and this area California has had almost no virus activity since West Nile came. If another way of looking this, this is during the introduction into the Central Valley. The, uh, the little black dots are positive chicken flocks, the, the gray ones are negative flocks. This is bytes per transmission, uh, color-coded. The hot areas in, in late June had the earliest virus activity. Then in the Central Valley, they you, you had a uh, uh, virus activity here and here, and then eventually throughout the valley uh, later in the summer as, the, as everything heated up. So trying to use bytes per transmission as a metric to look into the future, since this is a climate change talk. Uh, we do have estimates from uh, University of California San Diego for California surfaces and what we did is took those temperature projections uh, into, the f into a 50 year future and tried to see how it would affect bites per transmission. Well the hot areas of California had absolutely no change because it's already hot enough for transmission all the time most mostly, but the areas along the coast and into LA Basin became especially more efficient and these are the areas that are expected to have the highest degree of impact from warming if, it, if they do warm as we project. Another way of thinking of temperature is at the northern boundaries of uh, transmission. Uh, this is data from Canada the, this is in their surveillance program. 
They had a major epidemic of West Nile virus in 2007 centered in Saskatchewan of all places. I mean, for a, uh, an out of Africa Uganda virus to have an outbreak in Saskatchewan, sort of mind boggling. They've never had, for example, St. Louis epidemics in Saint Saskatchewan. They've had Western equine, which replicates better at cooler temperatures. Uh, but if you look at the temperatures, uh, you can see this is their, the dark line is their 50 year normal. The red line is my 14 degree centigrade guesstimate of the minimal uh, replication threshold. And this is 2007. If you notice that it's almost uh, 5 degrees, 10 degrees centigrade warmer that summer on average. So this is really, and the transmission season was extended from barely having two or three months above the minimum to having almost six months. So that's why they had an epidemic that year because the virus could replicate earlier in the year. There were probably more mosquito generations and the whole thing just snowballed. They had a similar outbreak in 2003, but the rest of the years, which were more normal temperatures, they they didn't have much in the way of virus activity at all. So I just thought, I had some thoughts about New York City, which I thought were at least interesting to me. And uh, why did the virus come and how did it get to be so successful? And I'm sure you, uh, guys like Ted that have been thinking about this a lot more than me probably have better ideas. But um, well, so the virus came from Israel. There was a single mutation at the NS249 position that imparted high virulence for crow, American crows. So the virus that came to New York had already uh, had this mutation and it was able to really replicate and kill crows at an alarming rate. Other, some of the other lineages and other variants without this mutation don't kill crows at the same high rate that the virus we have does. Um, similar strains with this mutation have caused localized outbreaks in Europe and Russia and Israel before and there's a nice paper by Aaron Brault describing this. The vector that is our urban vector, Culex pipiens, well this was a uh, introduction as well. This, uh, this, this mosquito evolved in the Ethiopian region and was sometime introduced into North America. So you've got the, an African virus and an African vector that were sort of introduced probably during the sailing ship era. Uh, interestingly, this urban species was able to herb, uh, overwinter at temperate latitudes, and this may have provided the mechanism for the virus to be able to persist. And, John Anderson, who's in the audience, has done some exquisite experiments showing exactly how this can occur in a remarkably efficient manner. Um, the urban hosts that are here, we also, the Brits didn't want to miss their house sparrows, so the, they used to be English sparrows when I was a kid because they introduced them into Europe as well as the starlings and some other birds that we probably wish they hadn't. <coughs> But so now you have an urban host and a, uh, uh, from the old world with an African vector and an African virus. Interestingly that the native birds, uh, the, uh, the urbanization has allowed the expansion of a lot of urban birds I think like American robins and out west we have house finches that exploit the same paradomestic environment. And they were introduced in the East Coast. I guess they're doing pretty good. The mycoplasma hasn't taken them out yet, huh? They're rebounding. I, somebody's giving me the wave here in the audience. <laughs> um, the virus has dead end hosts, but originally when the virus came, there were no vaccines, no drugs, and no naturally acquired immunity. So it was a virgin soil epidemic and there was disbanded infrastructure. New York had done away with a lot of the arbovirus programs that had been in place for quite a while and were very famous for uh, really classic studies on eastern equine and these had been disbanded not too, uh, about five years before it came. Also, uh, that summer uh, when the virus was first discovered, 
This was supposedly the hottest summer in New York City history, according to records from Central Park. And uh, so this, this I think, uh, certainly didn't hurt. Obviously, if the virus was introduced in December, it probably wouldn't have taken hold. But coming, being introduced sometime into this area of an extraordinarily hot summer, probably with higher mosquito counts because of it, probably contribute to the sex successful invasion. This is just some pictures of the where the Passer domesticus is now a, a, a circumglobal species moved around by man. We have a lot of them in California. Uh, this is the distribution of the of the uh, of the vectors also coast to coast. Uh, this is the, some of the other uh, players. This is the house finch that I think is critical in a lot of parts of California. It's very abundant in the Central Valley, but it's now uh, distributed over the East Coast as well. This is uh, our main mosquito out west, Culex tarsalis, and it has a large distribution, but it's really in these areas and here and in the Central Plains that it's important. It's important to notice that this mosquito also gets up into Canada because it tolerates cold a little better than the Pythians complex. So another indication that these birds are important, this is the, um, is the impact of their immunity on virus transmission. And this is, uh, these red lines are the seroprevalence in house finches and house sparrows in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, this is during the first year. This is the, the, the maroon bars are dead birds and the blue are uh, human cases. And during 2003, when the virus first came, there was very little detection. In 2004, it exploded into a large outbreak of human cases and huge numbers of dead crows where they were, I mean, there were, there were parks where the lawnmower man had to actually mow around the cadavers. So there were all these little tufts of grass marking the, the locations of dead crows. They were, just, they were just everywhere. What is interesting to me is that when the antibody in the house finches and house sparrows got upwards of about 25%, it just shut off. And uh, the outbreak just they didn't do any aerial spraying, they just did more larval control. But once that antibody rate got high and there was depopulation of the crows concurrently, that outbreak just subsided rather rapidly. And this, this is uh, over time, this is the uh, West Nile neuroinvasive cases. And this is the same antibody, this is these two species combined. And as over time, you'll see a, a decrease in this antibody as, they, as the hatching year birds replace the dying immune birds. And when it gets down to below about 10%, then we had another outbreak. And then this subsided and then got down below 10% and we had another outbreak in 2011. So it seems like the herd immunity in these two species is very critical as well as the depopulation of the crows. We did some blood meal analysis work and about, and just like you found in Orange County, most of the, most of the mosquitoes, the, uh, the vector mosquitoes, feed primarily on uh, these two species. Crows are, I think, are also important, although finding mosquitoes that have bitten a crow has been a bit of a, uh, problem, but if you look at the distribution of virus cases in Los Angeles, these are the uh, these are CAT scan st SAT scan statistics, and the um, the dark circles are human cases. The um, the dashed lines are c clusters of dead corvids, and the size of the circle is the incidence of human infection. If you, in, in summary, only about 41% of the LA population resided within the clusters, but 75% of the cases li uh, lived within these clusters of dead birds. 
and the incidence per thousand within was 5.9 as opposed to 1.3. This was also shown in the infection rates in mosquitoes being 8 per thousand within and only about 2 per thousand out. What's interesting is that in uh, Imperial, uh, in Coachella Valley, they don't have any corvids and they've yet to have a really major outbreak, although there's a lot of enzootic transmission and there's a lot of people that look like me. A lot of old people go there to retire and so these are the people that have the highest um, clinical disease and so you would, if there was a lot of transmission you'd expect to be, see a lot of sick old people and we just haven't seen the cases and there's hardly any corvids here at all. Up in the Bakersfield area we have mostly scrub jays and these tend to be territorial and as such we don't really see a clustering of cases as we did in Los Angeles. Uh, more back to temperature, this is uh, the distribution of human cases last summer. So after years of sort of having a little fade out of the epidemic, last year was a resurgence back to probably the incidence of human infection that was similar to 2003 based on neuroinvasive cases. But I keep referring to neuroinvasive disease because the physicians are not readily testing for febrile cases, so total cases don't really reflect activity. They were reflecting physician interests in having tests done. The neuroinvasive cases, however, if you have someone coming to a hospital with neuroinvasive disease, the docs usually want to figure out why this person is so sick, and they usually get tested. Not always. Uh, we, we did a study of ER admissions in California recently and about only one out of five are getting tested but somehow the docs are testing the right people because we tested the other 80 percent and they're not getting it. They, there were very few cases they missed. But, uh, so that story still sort of out on that. This is the temperature anomaly. This is the temperature of 2012 compared to, uh, what was that, it's 1950 to 95, long-term average. And you can see that it was almost three degrees centigrade warmer in the Midwest, and this is where most of the cases were. The epicenter from last summer was in Dallas, Texas, and uh, they had about a third of the nation's cases. Uh, California, unfortunately, ranked second with about 500 cases this summer. One of the things that we're talking about with anthropogenic change is the adjustable mortgages in the housing market have had a remarkable effect on West Nile and mosquitoes. And this is data from Kern County from 2006 going into the housing crash of 2007. And you notice there's about a 300% increase in the numbers of uh, notice of delinquency and notices of state sales in Kern County. <clears throat> Concurrently then, people walked away from homes and the swimming pools. And this is what they turned out look, looking like. And they're just great aquariums for growing mosquitoes. Uh, this is a shot of Bake, an aerial image of Bakersfield in which I counted 42 pools, seven of them which, of which are about, uh, were probably looking like this. And interestingly, when we collected mosquitoes out of the pools, the rural mosquito, Culex tarsalis, had moved into town to exploit this habitat because more than half of the mosquitoes coming out of the pools were the, uh, were the better rural vector. Concurrently, in 2007, there was a 300% increase in West Nile cases in Bakersfield that was directly related, I think, to these bad swimming pools and the increase in mosquito numbers. So in summary, uh, West Nile is a zoonosis. It's amplified among birds and mosquitoes. And it's their ecology and demography that is most important for outbreaks because humans are dead end hosts. A lot of the work is done with numbers of human cases, but it doesn't really show the amount of virus activity that's really in an area, but rather how exposed people are 
and how readily they're being diagnosed by physicians. Urbanization has had an important effect on this virus because I think right now, for most of the papers I've read, it's essentially a suburban urban problem and it's not something that you go out and leave your house and go fishing to catch. You go in the backyard and have a barbecue and invite the neighbors over and that's when you all get infected. You can ask uh, Lyle Peterson uh, who is head of the, uh, uh, the group in Fort Collins who got infected himself playing evening volleyball with shorts on. Uh, so I mean it, it's, it's right there in your, in your neighbor yard. Uh, warm temperature as I've hopefully shown enables transmission by uh, increasing the size of the mosquito population increasing their, their the, decreasing the duration of the gonotrophic cycle or the number of bites per time interval, shortening the duration of the extrinsic incubation period. So all this tumbles upon itself. You have more mosquitoes biting more frequently, transmitting virus earlier in life as it gets warmer. <clears throat> and as we think of climate change, we're going into perhaps a time when this whole area of permissible habitat uh, temperature regimens are moving north, upslope, and uh, the areas like that are endemic already will have longer transmission seasons and shorter overwintering periods. So the virus may be able to pass the winter more efficiently that way and be just a more effective problem in the future. Um, in my remaining 10 minutes, I thought I'd maybe talk about another virus pretty quickly because I think it presents an interesting story of an anthropogenic uh, uh, sort of impact. This is an alpha virus that uh, causes a very bad arthralgia. It was discovered in Africa as well and it, it, it has nothing to do with chickens. It means in this dialect in Africa, it means he who is bent up because of the very severe arthralgia causing people to just bend over because it's so painful. It was discovered during the dengue uh, survey and dengue of course used to be break bone fever so it's the same really severe arthralgia that comes with it. The, it emerged out of Africa and there were repeated outbreaks in Asia during the 60s and the 90s and it sort of disappeared especially from Asia leading people to think that the, the vector Aedes aegypti couldn't maintain it in these urban environments in that situation. Um, in 2004 to 2008 it re-emerged and this was related, related directly to the expansion of another uh, Asian vector, Aedes albopictus, a mutation of the virus, and perhaps some climate events that may have helped the whole thing along. The virus has uh, three lineages, one from West Africa, uh, another one from East Central Africa, and then there was an Asian lineage. This is the current global distribution right now. The virus, uh, as I mentioned, started in, uh, in, Af in East, uh, West Africa and then progressively moved across. These are where there were previous outbreaks. In the 50s, it moved into Asia. And when I was in the Philippines in the 60s, we actually went on a chikungunya outbreak in uh, Visayan Islands in Negros Oriental. Um, in 2004, the virus again emerged moved through the offshore African islands and into India and from India into an outbreak in Italy and these yellow dots uh, are very incomplete but show some of the places that uh, viremic travelers have been inter intercepted. So this is the environment where the virus began in the, tr in the canopy of West African forests uh, then transmitted to humans near the forest as opposed to when it moves into the drier parts of Africa where Aedes aegypti was considered the vector in villages that look more like this where they store water and then you're going from no longer having a primate component into a just human-human transmission. And then from there it's into the 
slums in Africa and again water storage and Aedes aegypti being the most important component. Aedes aegypti was moved around the world just like I would mentioned the Pipians had during the sailing era. It's an African mosquito evolved in Africa and was moved throughout the, the circumglobally uh, throughout the New World where it uh, was important in yellow fever and dengue transmission. This is a very, very old, out-of-date map. Um, this is, uh, it's, it's very prevalent in India right now as well. So in 2004, there was uh, some of the things setting the stage is uh, there were a lot of Indian workers that moved to East Africa during the British colonial period to work and manage the railroads. So there's a, a lot of Indian families that still communicate back and forth, just like we were talking about uh, West Nile coming from the Mediterranean, the strain being related to Israel, uh, where there's a lot of families that travel back and forth to the New, new, uh, to the new York area. Uh, there's an expanded international used tire trade between Asia and the U.S. and Europe, which has spread Aedes albopictus around the world. Um, economical air travel has allowed extensive travel between East Africa and India, and humans probably transported the virus around. And uh, there was a mutation uh, in the virus in East Africa that seemed to enhance infection in Aedes albopictus. And uh, this, is the, this is the original distribution of albopictus, an Asian mosquito. The red areas are all the places it was introduced. Climate played a very important role in this because when it was introduced in Texas, it's not by chance it went east and not west because this species has been tracking the very humid southeastern area and this is where it's done uh, this is where it's done best in areas with high rainfall as opposed to the west although recently <clears throat> it's made a toehold in Los Angeles so when the tires get to be about this much worn they're no longer good and have to be recapped and they throw them into big depositories and then package them up and send them off for recapping so they can be reused this sitting out in the, in the open, getting wet, is a great, mosquitoes love these to lay eggs in, and they, when you package them up like this, you're taking everything that's in the tire with them. Also, uh, in California, we had the movement of lucky bamboo, which they used to pick in China and put them in water and in styrofoam boxes and then put them in big shipping containers and offload them in LA and that's how we got our Aedes albopictus there from southern China. If you look at the genetics of the mosquitoes that's where their center, that's where their origin seems to be. The mutation made it easier for albopictus to transmit at a lower dose. This is the blood meal titer data from uh, Steve Higgs's lab uh, being transmitted more effectively at a lower dose, but this only seemed to work for albopictus and not for aegypti, and the curves for aegypti look just the same. Interestingly, the virus, this is the, another map of the distribution in Kenya, moving to uh, Reunion and uh, Mauritius and some of these offshore islands. This is an interesting curve and shows the importance, I think, of air travel and how these viruses move around the world. This, um, these bars are the numbers of human cases of chikungunya in France. And this is, this is the epidemic curve on uh, Reunion. So all these uh, French tourists went to the island and picked up chikungunya and it has an incubation period. They were probably feeling just fine when they hopped on the plane. They get off, they get off in, in France and then became sick. And these are the number of cases, that just huge numbers of cases. Uh, luckily for the French, that at that time, Albopictus wasn't found in France. And so far, they've made some interceptions, but it hasn't really become established. 
The Italians were not so lucky because uh, Albo Pictus is doing great on the boot all the way up into the Bologna area. And this is where they had an outbreak of 450 alloctonous cases, which they traced back to uh, one tourist from, or a visitor from India. Uh, this is a map showing the potential distribution of Albo Pictus based on a GARP model. This is temperature driven, but this is areas where they think that uh, in red that have a higher probability of getting Albo Pictus established. So with the vector established over a bigger area, <clears throat> if it were well established in France when all these people were coming back from Reunion, I'm sure the virus would have had a better time of it in France. So finally, this is Los Angeles. Each of these little dots is somebody's house <coughs> that they found Albo Pictus at, and they've not been able to get rid of it. This is the third summer in a row that it's been there. They thought they eradicated it when they first picked it up 10 years ago. They had no reports, no complaints, and then three years ago, this lady called up and said, you know, I'm getting bit by these little black mosquitoes. Could you come and take a look? And, and they hadn't, uh, we have no day biting little black mosquitoes. So the entomologists from LA ran out there and they found uh, this area here had uh, quite a few positives. And then they started doing surveys and found them all over and pretty well entrenched. And they've had uh, hundred man marches through these areas, you know, dumping pots, sanitation, trying to get rid of it, and they've not been successful yet. So it's interesting how, you know, once these things get established, it, it's just hard as heck to get rid of them. And once you get a, a vector moving into an area, it sets the stage for whatever it can transmit. And then if you have a warming environment on top of this, it really facilitates the whole picture and it allows these tropical viruses or even other temperate viruses a much better chance of coming in and getting a toehold and creating really serious health problems. And um, we did, uh, we, I like to claim everything. Uh, uh, Jan at uh, uh, UC Irvine sequenced this and compared it to some specimens he got from China as well as from the previous infestation and they're all from the same part of China whether or not our claim to having eradicated them in the early uh, 2000s is correct or not we don't know if it's if they persisted in this neighborhood they don't have they've been looking all over the rest of LA and they don't seem to be doing well they seem to be confined to this area and haven't spread to the rest of LA or California yet. So some concluding thoughts. Humans have changed the planet to provide space and resources to support our growing population size. Expanding cities are bringing together vectors and hosts that exploit this niche where transmission becomes urbanized and I think more efficient. Climate warming enables transmission over an expanding portion of the earth and movement by humans and commerce allows for the rapid transports of hosts, vectors, and pathogens amongst these areas. And uh, that's my view of the uh, importance of climate change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We're starting time for questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, on your two slides ago, when you were showing Los Angeles, there was a red cluster with a lot of these um, mosquitoes, and then some with none. Is there something distinct about these areas? What is that? Uh, well, well, these are, uh, this is I stole from the entomologist in Los Angeles, and she was planning uh, campaigns to go door to door, and she had, uh, this area here where she was wondering if they had moved into so they were going to survey these areas and this area they had found a couple and they wanted to do more intensive work and these were considered their hot zones here where they found more of the positives that's all it means okay so there's not like more water more 
if you went there, if you went to these neighbors, I went out there with them and went walking around down there, and you wouldn't think that Albopictus would do well at all. I mean, Albopictus is all over my in-laws' properties in the Philippines, and it doesn't look anything like that. I mean, these are uh, a lot of concrete, pretty open uh, trailer parks with not too much green, some potted plants. There's a fairly large uh, Hispanic and Asian population that likes little potted plants, and of course each of them has a saucer and so that's and buckets and some people have um, more vegetated yards and that's where the adults seem to congregate. So they get this breeding in a variety of different areas, not necessarily having adults there. The adults go into whose ever backyard has the most plants because it's more humid. Uh, I think what's really containing these in some degree is the is it's a lot drier in LA and I think that's probably not letting them expand out. I don't know why they haven't got in the arboretum because they they uh, go ahead and dump water all over that. Albo picked this bites stuff other than people so they don't need people really but they haven't found it. I, uh, they also had a I think somewhere in here there's like a tire operation and they went through the whole tires couldn't find anything in the tires but they ran um, a whole bunch of these uh, little ova traps and they and and they also were looking in people's backyards <coughs> now what they, now what they've been doing is every every operator has a drill so when they go into backyards if they find anything holding water they drill a hole in it <laughs> that's 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 been their primary control Steve Dobson is thinking of releasing Wolbachia there and to see if that's going to help but uh, We'll see. It's John? A few, uh, three or four slides before this one, you showed uh, the geographical distribution of Alba Pictus, I guess worldwide. And you had orange dots, and then you had two black dots indicating that um, Alba Pictus, I think, was eradicated. Um, and one of them was Hawaii, and then the other was maybe in. in uh, yep. uh, I couldn't tell, but what state it was in. But I well, those are, uh, I won't take credit from the maps. I stole those from Chet Moore. And uh, Chet, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the black dots. That's why I was trying to find this, to tell you the truth. And I'm not doing very well. Sorry. There. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, there is. Now, I just wondered where that was. Uh, I don't know. So, sorry for all that to say. I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know exactly where this is. This looks like Michigan. Yes, yeah, pretty high up for. Because I know they have a hell of a lot of them in Illinois. Because Uriel Catrone did a whole bunch of studies on them in, uh, Il in, when they came into Illinois. Um, why this is black, I'm not I sure. This, is, this must be Hawaii here, huh? I don't know where this is. Well, I'm not sure. I, okay, one quick question, and uh, Jamie wants to fire a few at you. Uh, <laughs> what viruses have you isolated from Elbow Pictures in California? Nothing. We haven't tested any. We, we did go ahead and develop, well, okay, so we do all the testing for the surveillance program. And so in looking for, not looking forward to, uh, in, in case something comes in, we do have a multiplex that'll test for all the dengues, chikungunya, and West Nile in one assay. And then we have a pan uh, dengue that'll separate out the dengue uh, types. But we don't, uh, there's not, they've not been collecting enough adults or had any link to disease to warrant us testing them yet. So we haven't. Sorry, Peter. I want to follow up on what John's talking about, and that is the species distribution. 
And that is, I think in one of your slides, you showed in the Los Angeles area the distribution or the prevalence of clinical fasciitis rather than carcellus. So where does clinical fasciitis play into? Well, that is the vector in LA. Right. And so, but the tarsalis is coming in as well? Well, I, the picture I showed yeah. with the bad swimming pool of the right. tarsalis, that was in Bakersfield. And the twinks don't go in there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a, uh, and actually uh, for the Pipians aficionados, the introgression of Pipians into the quinks starts at about uh, Fresno North and that Fresno South and in the southern part of the state, based on some recent microsatellite work by Harry Savage, seems to think that those are all quinks, true quinks. And uh, they, they're feeding mostly a little different than they found in Texas and other places. These feed predominantly on these urban birds and some dogs and almost no humans. Uh, we, we have the same kind of results you do. We look, look very, very hard in a lot of really strange places and they just, these mosquitoes feed on humans very infrequently. But that being said, when we have like a barbecue in the backyard, I'll get bit by tarsalis. But when you go out and collect blood and mosquitoes, those, those individuals must be pretty rare. Well, so you don't really see that much. No, in fact, you showed some slides on urbanization at present time, and urbanization is going to accelerate. And along with urbanization, at the margins of cities, you tend to get slums or shen towns or less developed areas, and those grade into natural, semi-natural habitat. Do you have any information on, not, you, I don't think these viruses in the United States provide any information on, but elsewhere, the patterns of arboviral transmission? Along these succession zones and what's going on in terms of populations at risk? Well, um, okay, so if I were to, I, I, this is speaking and not knowing, no, okay, <laughs> uh, <coughs> but um, we did some studies back when St. Louis was coming into Los Angeles and we did neighborhood surveys and we compared uh, lower socioeconomic neighbor like blue collar neighborhoods with small houses to probably houses that cost tenfold more and those areas were heavily vegetated nicely landscaped more irrigated and they had way more mosquitoes and uh, than the poorer places the poorer guys were more apt to have bad swimming pools and junk in the yard and and Alex, the big dog that we wouldn't go in the backyard anyway. But uh, the numbers of mosquitoes in both traps and that we could collect or larvae that we could find were much more abundant in the heavier landscape yards. So in that situation, it's sort of the better, I think the landscaping and the vegetation patterns plays an important role. And some of the areas that they were seeing more St. Louis transmission at that time was in these higher end neighborhoods, which is why they paid me to do this, <laughs> because those were the more well-to-do constituents of the Mesquita District. In, um, I've just reviewed a paper not too long ago from uh, <coughs> uh, Vietnam where they're looking at JE in urban gradients, and they're finding uh, JE transmitted in amongst pigs in urban areas just as high as they are in rural areas. Where the mosquitoes from uh, may be all from the rice but they apparently are flying into town enough or it's being transmitted by quinks. Most people don't think quinks is really good JE vectors but <coughs> something's all the they hit a hundred percent zero positivity in his urban pigs by the end of the transmission season. Not my data, but that's what they reported. John, you re have faded <coughs> times to your talk, talking about a virus that you didn't really focus on. And that was St. Louis encephalitis virus. Mm -hmm. Why has St. Louis encephalitis virus seemingly almost disappeared in the recent decades? 
Well, what, what's your idea? I don't have a good one. <laughs> You're the one to keep talking about it. All right, so I opened my mouth and, op and, and so now I should say something. So the, uh, um, it, was on, it was on decline before West Nile came, at least in California. And so if you, if you get blamed because you're having outbreaks, you ought to take credit for having improved mosquito control and perhaps doing enough pressuring of mosquito populations to make a difference. So I think that in California anyway, the demise of Western Equine and St. Louis, which are transmitted by the same mosquitoes, was in part due to improved mosquito control and better, uh, better operations. But when West Nile came, West Nile, uh, because of the more efficient, vir uh, higher viremias in birds and more effective transmission, I think the entomological thresholds for transmission are way lower. When we had our outbreak in Davis, we were getting huge counts of like three or four pipians per gravid trap night, and that was sufficient. And when you test them, you'd get positive pools out of them. Whereas historically, if you didn't have hundreds of mosquitoes in your traps, you didn't really see St. Louis transmission. So I think that played an important role. The other thing is there is uh, what may have pushed it over the edge is cross immunity. We have one paper where we did a cross, and f cross, cross immunity studies in house finches. So a house finch that survives West Nile infection has sterilizing immunity against St. Louis. But a house finch that, well, they all survive St. Louis, but when they get infected with West Nile on top of that, they will be able to produce a viremia sufficient to infect some mosquitoes. So there definitely was an advantage to West Nile in that cross immunity uh, situation in house finches. I didn't do it in any other birds, so that's all I know. Okay, I think we're going to have to terminate the questions. I'm sorry, Bill's got a people to see and a plane to catch.